Great Britain is home to a delicate ecosystem of political, legal and cultural institutions. The monarchy, the House of Commons and the House of Lords, the judiciary, the common law, Oxford and Cambridge universities, the National Trust, the British Library, the Bodleian, the British Museum and the Natural History Museum, the Navy, the BBC and so many more. They are part of a rich tapestry collectively woven by the people who have called this land home for well over a thousand years. And it is through these institutions that we have made this place home. Repositories of intergenerational wisdom, a source of order elevating us to greater heights in art, music, literature, academia and science, protecting our ancient rights and way of life. Over the generations, our institutions have been the custodians of our culture and identity, but I wonder whether over the past 50 years or so, we have failed to be theirs. In the last year, we have seen a flurry of revolutionary fervour. Statues and monuments toppled and defaced, streets and pubs renamed, attempts to censor and edit our past, to make it conform to the ideological worldview of the activists. The woke finder generals have found signs of sin in everything, and the list of heretics, past and present, grows day by day. But what exactly are we seeing, and how worried should we be? In the 1790s, an anti-Christian mob almost destroyed Notre Dame Cathedral. The French revolutionaries decapitated statues as well as people, and they didn't care very much if the statues were the biblical kings of Judah rather than the kings of France. For an entire decade during the 60s and 70s, Mao Zedong whipped up a vicious storm of revolutionary fervour among students to destroy what the communists called the Four Olds, customs, culture, habits and ideas. Streets, places and even people were renamed. Bourgeois pets were murdered, books and musical instruments were destroyed. Even cemeteries, the remains of emperors were dragged out and posthumously denounced and burned. For the French, it was year one of the revolutionary calendar. For the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, it was year zero. Convinced of their vision, they would eliminate anyone or anything that stood in the way of the march of progress until the world was made to conform, flush with their ideology. As George Orwell wrote in 1984, every record has been destroyed or falsified, every book rewritten, every picture has been repainted, every statue and street building has been renamed, Every date has been altered, and the process is continuing day by day and minute by minute. History has stopped. Nothing exists except an endless present in which the party is always right. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. After George Floyd was murdered by a police officer in 2020, a wave of moral panic swept across the Atlantic. Ideas that had once been the preserve of a certain school of academics were suddenly at the forefront of public discussion. Systemic racism and white supremacy were baked into the very fabric of our societies. We needed to urgently dismantle, deconstruct and decolonize. History was viewed as a struggle between the oppressors and the oppressed, defined by intersecting victim groups according to race, gender and sexuality. The whole of Western history was in the docks. It's interesting to see the wheel turn full circle. The same ideas come up again and again. Marx, of course, was the person who really wanted to split the world into oppressed and oppressor. And he he looked towards creating a utopia. He believed the utopia could only come by force, in fact, by bloodshed. Specifically, he said, revolutionary terrorism is the only way to be able to see through the birth pangs 
of the new society. That's pretty radical. His ideas have been taken on over the years. They've been changed. It's not right to call uh, black liberation theology or critical race theory Marxist, but it has its ancestry in those ideas, splitting society into two opposing forces. And I think today we're seeing the same thing. The very meaning of words is being changed. We've grown up with an idea that racism uh, it involves acts of unpleasant, discriminatory, even violent behaviour towards people of a different ethnic origin. That is what we've been told it is. Now we are told that racism is not that. Racism is something that we inherit by the very colour of our skin, by being a member of a society with a majority that is white. That's a huge stretch of the imagination because people can justifiably say in Britain today, which has one of the best records of all, I'm not a racist. But now you can't say that because you are a racist because racism is permanently embedded in society. And while you are a supporter of that society, you are taking part in a racist society. Hmm. So we have to overthrow it. To your average onlooker, this seemed confusing. It wasn't the worst figures that history had to offer that were being attacked. It was people like Abraham Lincoln, who abolished slavery in the United States, or Sir Winston Churchill, who defeated fascism in Europe. People like the father of modern policing, Robert Peel, or the naval hero, Horatio Nelson. I, I think um, activists do want Britishness disgraced. I'm not absolutely sure how far they've thought it through, but I think that if you establish that the modern concept of British, Britishness derives, which is I think what they think, from what they would call colonialism, then it follows that you would wish to uh, break that idea of Britishness. And you would, even the sort of good things like parliamentary democracy, sort of more obviously good things like parliamentary democracy, you would wish to undermine because you'd say, um, okay, there was parliamentary democracy in Britain, but it wasn't allowed in India or whatever. Um, or you would say, well, you call it parliamentary democracy, but women didn't have any votes until 1918 and so on. Um, so I think it's trying to um, uh, uh, do the opposite of whitewash um, the uh, Brit Britain's past. And whereas most people would think that you see, what, you see, one thing I think that, that the, the activists don't understand is it's actually well understood by most people that you can both greatly admire a national leader and have a critical faculty about him. So, you know, nobody minds reading about the fact that Lord Nelson was a very difficult bugger in many ways um, and uh, uh, will have many sins to his charge, not least in the sexual department, but he will also have been a great genuine heroic commander who saved this country from um, Napoleonic invasion. And similarly, Winston Churchill, I mean, nobody who studies the life of Winston Churchill would find everything that they would agree with or admire. You know, he, he's, there are all sorts of things you could be very critical of. People understand that perfectly well, but they also recognize that Churchill was a great war leader who again, um, saved this country um, and helped to save the world from the worst uh, tyranny that's perhaps ever been devised. That counts for nothing if everything you think is, is bad in the world is to do with racism and particularly racism filtered through white Anglo men. And there's no sense of proportion here or of historicity, the way people talk and think about things at different times. It just cancels everything. If you can find, um, you know, an off-colour remark about India by Churchill made in 1910 or something, that's it. He's out. Um, and in this respect, I think that um, these activists are, among other things, like 17th century Puritans who smash up smashed up um, images of Jesus in churches or something. They've got a very strong idea about what is pure and good. 
and everything that is, doesn't fit in that idea of purity and goodness must actually literally be destroyed. It's very important, I think, that they say concern about statues. They actually want to smash up things which stand for what they believe to be wrong rather than let those things stay, which are any, in any free society that's what you would want, um, but feel free to criticise the people depicted in those statues. It's, it's, it's true, extreme, borderline mad Puritanism. How did we get here? Some have pointed to the long march through the institutions, an idea inspired by new left thinker Antonio Gramsci, but coined by student activist Rudy Dutschka in the 1960s. It described a means of setting the conditions for revolution, subverting institutions, softening them up. How has this happened to our institutions? Is this the result of a long march? Uh, I, I suspect, like most things in history, it's a kind of confluence of different, of different things. Um, um, but it, it, the, the, the fact that I've talked about postmodernist philosophy, um, more broadly, uh, Marxism, um, and, and, and these, these views have influenced, not uniformly throughout our universities, but, but particularly in the arts and humanities, perhaps, perhaps some parts of the social, social sciences. So it does, it does seem as if we're seeing the fruits of uh, um, a period, who knows how long, a decade, two decades, three decades, um, of, of the influence of certain ideas. I don't think it's possible to um, explain it completely and it, it possibly can't be explained even by its adherents completely. Uh, but I think the idea is something like um, powerful people, particularly white people and particularly men, um, have exploited people for hundreds, even thousands of years um, uh, to advance their power and wealth. And they have persecuted people who get in the way of that or enslaved them or both. Um, and uh, that must be extirpated. Um, and the descendants of those people must be punished. Um, and all those, all that those white people have done, those white men have done, is um, to construct a superstructure to conceal their selfish motives um, of what they call civilization, which is self-serving. There has been the influence in uh, some parts of academia, more than others, but some parts, particularly in the arts and humanities, uh, of postmodernist thinking, uh, where uh, reason is not to be trusted because reason is simply the tool of power um, and um, therefore what, if, if that's true then when someone like me makes an argument uh, you if you're a, a, um, a, a woke um, anti-Rhodes Black Lives Matter uh, agitator uh, you won't take what I say seriously because what I say can simply be, according to your point of view, uh, the expression of my, my privilege and my economic interest. It, it's basically a Marxist idea. Uh, so so this, this idea that uh, reason is not to be trusted and is simply the, the tool of um, class or racial interest um, ha has probably infected a lot of academic thought. Um, and if you add to that, well, uh, well I, I guess, uh, um, Michel Foucault was himself postmodernist, so there's a classic example of, of someone who regards all hierarchies as, as driven by power and by implication unjust power. Um, so so you, you don't take what's said at face value, you, you, um, you attack the person or you use political means to try and undermine their platform. Um, and I think that is corrupting, uh, partly because um, w w one thing that those who hold these views never seem to think is they might be mistaken, that, that they might be mistaken, and therefore there needs to be some kind of self-criticism, um, some reflective self-criticism, and 
too often there isn't. What is clear is that ideas that were popularised by American universities are now widely held by those in charge of British institutions. Those who are supposed to be custodians of our heritage instead see it as oppressive and problematic. They see it as something to be judged and picked apart rather than cherished and protected. I think many things are going on. I think somewhere in there is a good instinct that um, people in the past and even in the present have had a bad time because of their ethnic background and that should be a legitimate concern of um, public policy and education and so on but I think it's gone far beyond that and in fact I think it's been infiltrated by other ideas so I think the good nature of, and concern of a lot of people has been exploited um, by people who actually have a political cultural agenda which is to um, cast anathema on Western civilization, possibly in a way on the whole idea of civilization actually, um, and um, uh, even whether Western or not, but particularly Western, mm -hmm. um, and therefore to use a, a, an institution which is classically an example of civilization to destroy that civilization. Sir Isaac Newton is one of the greatest mathematical minds in history. He laid the foundations of modern science and aged only 23, wrote his equation for universal gravitation. When Sheffield University decided to decolonize their engineering curriculum, they said that they wanted to challenge Eurocentric and white saviour approaches to maths and science, much of which was developed in the 19th century. And Newton found himself on a list labelled as a beneficiary of colonial era activity. The University of Leicester also planned to decolonise their English curriculum by reducing the teaching of over a thousand years of English literature. Chaucer, Beowulf, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, Thomas Mallory, the Viking sagas and anything written before the 16th century is at risk. Academics feared cuts to the teaching of John Milton, Christopher Marlowe and John Donne. Um, the idea, it seems to be present in the idea of decolonization, namely that um, only the, 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 the black students or Asian students or can, can only relate properly to texts written by black people or Asian people is nonsense. Um, it, it's just nonsense. Uh, white people can appreciate text written by non-white people, non-white people can appreciate text written by white people. Um, if the complaint is that um, non-white students don't feel comfortable in an academic environment where all the texts are written by white people, they want some kind of, you know, feel as if their people is represented in a, in a reading list. I, I suppose at that point I, I'd say, look, this is this is Northwest Europe. This is not Cosmopolis. We're not nowhere. We're we're here. We have certain intellectual traditions, um, and of course, therefore, our curricula tend to be Eurocentric. This is Europe, <laughs> um, which is not to say that in our universities you can't choose if you if you go. To if you take the right courses, you can't choose to spend all your time studying South Asian studies or African studies or Chinese. Um, but uh, you would expect universities in Europe to have a certain European bias. Some universities changed the names of buildings and sought to remove memorials. Liverpool dropped the name of former Liberal Prime Minister William Gladstone from a building because his family stood accused of benefiting from slavery. The University of Edinburgh removed the name of David Hume, one of Scotland's most famous philosophers. What are your thoughts on the decolonisation of libraries, museums and theology? Is this a rewriting of history? Are they being dishonest about the past? Yeah, I think they are. To decolonise something means that you need to look at it first of all and then decide that it is wrong for a particular reason. It's wrong for for its reflection of British imperial history. Well, as I've been saying, British imperial history is very complex and very nuanced. 
There are pluses, there are very definitely minuses. There are good people and bad people. People do good things, they do bad things. When you're talking about generalizing a race or a nation, it, it's, really, it's really impossible to do. People like to do it because it makes it so much easier to be able to point a finger at evil. But it, it's never that simple. So trying to decolonize something has to start on the basis that what, there, it is, what is there in the first place is wrong. We, we've got some situations where some ridiculous things are, are being suggested, where statues are taken down of people who have a vague connection or have an actual connection with imperial history. I think, if I'm right, Sir Bartle Freer is one. Wonderful, wonderful name. Bartle Freer was indeed a great believer in the empire and in Britain's place in the world as a central power which could bring civilization. something we might genuinely question today. Bartle Freer was also responsible for helping to put down the slave trade in Africa. So maybe we should just leave this statue up. Maybe we should leave a lot of these statues up. And we should just look at history and say history is nuanced. People do good things and bad things in their own lives. To pick one bad thing or one thing which in today's context we think is bad and then to decide on that basis we have to rename a student hall and in the case of the Gladstone Hall I believe instead have a communist um, name to be used instead. I, mean, I could say an awful lot about that. It, it, it doesn't stack up. It, it, it's great for working up people's resentment. Because if you want to build a movement, you have to build a movement. It, it's much easier to build a movement out of creating resentment than it actually is out of building some, uh, suggesting something positive. I think there is an element of hypocrisy in the university's attitude um, because it's pretty safe or relatively safe to attack your benefactors. I mean, for example, Jesus College Cambridge is busily attacking Tobias Rustat, who uh, generously endowed it in 1675 or whatever it was, um, and um, uh, never did it any harm. But they're now trying to take his statue out of the chapel and they've renamed things that were named after him and so on. At the same time, they're taking a lot of money from uh, Chinese Communist Party uh, backed bodies in China, some business, some um, governmental, some uh, academic, I think, um, uh, to uh, put out things which amount to little more than pro-Chinese propaganda uh, in their college, college. And of course, modern China is an empire. Um, uh, it, it, it has all the characteristics of an empire, like spreading power across the world by soft means and hard means, um, uh, pursuing its commercial interests and persecuting uh, groups of people such as the Uyghurs or conquering and persecuting um, places that don't belong to it anyway, such as Tibet. Um, and of course, you, you literally can't get um, the grandees of Cambridge University to talk about this at all, whereas they're happy to talk about Tobias Rastat or whoever um, till the cows come home. So I think there is a, a dissonance there. The Roads Must Fall campaign started at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, but by 2015 it was here in Oxford, with activists calling to remove this statue of Cecil Rhodes from above the door of Oriel College. Passed by daily and forgotten by history, it has become a symbolic flashpoint as the dispute was reignited in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement. Is Rhodes who they say he is? No, he's not. Um, one thing that's really struck me ever since this row broke out in Oxford in late 2015 is that uh, those who are clamouring for Rhodes's dismantling know very little about history at all. Um, uh, as it happens, when the row broke out, I uh, was in the middle of reading, I think, the second or third of the biographies of Rhodes that I've now read. and. Um, I was very struck by how claims that Rhodes was a 
was South Africa's Hitler, that he was uh, uh, involved in genocide, that he was responsible for the, the concentration camps that uh, um, were uh, put in place during the, the Boer War. None of these things were true. And, and I, I, I published an article in Standpoint magazine in March 2016 to, to explain why these things weren't true. Uh, and I've been struck by how uh, no one in the last uh, five years has contradicted what I said. And yet, <laughs> when, when the Rose Must Fall campaign revived uh, last year, the, the same charges were being made against Rhodes. So th th those, those who are agitating for Rhodes to fall, uh, I, I infer, aren't much interested in the truth about the past. In the end, the Independent Commission backed the College's wish to remove the statue from the Grade II listed building, but decided that ultimately it would be too costly and complex. Instead, they said they would focus on contextualising the College's relationship with Rhodes. So Rhodes won't fall, at least for the time being. During the first wave of the Black Lives Matter protests, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, announced that he was setting up a commission for diversity in the public realm. It complained that statues, monuments and street names reflected a bygone era. Near Parliament, Cromwell stands in an eternal face-off with Charles I, and that is typical of our public space, with its thousands of years of naturally accumulated history, a diversity and tension that reveals a truth all of its own. If we had statues uh, to, to take the hackneyed example, um, Adolf Hitler, even Stalin or Pol Pot, uh, the people who were uh, um, simply um, and centrally murderous on a, on a huge scale, I would vote to have them taken down. Um, most people who are um, sculpted into statues uh, were not so simply wicked and evil. Uh, their rec records were, were ambiguous. So Edward Colston, yes, he did make money out of, out of uh, slavery, but he's not being celebrated in Bristol, or he was not being celebrated in Bristol because he was a slave owner. He was being celebrated because of his philanthropy. Um, so, you know, so, so Colston was not only a slave owner, but also a, a major philanthropist. So, so that case, it seems to me, is, is um, more ambiguous. And, and s since it's my view that, that um, no human being um, is simply a saint, all human beings have their flaws. Um, so if we're going to celebrate anybody, we, we've got to be willing to celebrate people who have mixed records. And then, then finally, um, we in Britain, we have a plural polit <coughs> political culture. Um, so you will see um, um, conservative heroes like <coughs> Winston Churchill in statues. You will see uh, left-wing heroes um, um, in, in statues. Uh, so I would vote to keep our, our public spaces politically plural um, because, because the contrast in itself gets us to, to think and, and to, uh, to, to, th to think about the, the, the competition and, and the contrasts and that's a good liberal thing to do. The National Trust is supposed to take care of our historic buildings and lands but it's become so politicised that a group of its members have set up a new organisation called Restore Trust that is aimed at steering the National Trust back towards its original purpose and away from the demonisation of our history. The National Trust released a report detailing 93 of its properties that it said had historical links to slavery and colonialism. Churchill's home, Chartwell, the home of Rudyard Kipling, stained because empire was a central theme in his literary work. William Wordsworth's home, because his brother, John, served as a commander on an East India Company ship in 1801. I thought the National Trust's listing of those of its properties that were connected with slavery or colonialism was um, very, really misconceived. Uh, first of all, slavery and colonialism are quite separate ideas. Slavery is a fact, basically. It either happened or it didn't. 
uh, and I think all of us would agree with this, I think all of us would agree that it was a bad fact. Colonialism is an ism which is um, invented by its opponents. So actually, I don't know what it is. Um, if, you, if, if you mean the British Empire, well, at least you're sort of talking about something that is def definitely existed. But within this thing called the British Empire, there were enormously varied views and experience of uh, practice um, about what to do, some of which stand the test of time very well and others which stand it very poorly. Um, to lump all these together and then to sort of tag them against your properties seems a very weird and unhistorical and unbalanced thing to do. It does matter to tell the history of how every property came to exist and where the money came from. And you often find that there are all sorts of sources of money which would seem worse than others. Somebody said that um, behind every uh, great fortune lies a great crime. And um, there's some truth in that. And um, uh, so why do you have 92 slavery and colonialism? properties, but you say nothing about all the houses, some of which belong to the National Trust, like Fountains Abbey, which Henry VIII stole from the Catholics. You know, why, why, why are that not there? Why do you not say something about uh, William Armstrong's house, Cragside, which was made out of money from armaments? Um, uh, no doubt other people would, would complain about tobacco fortunes or drink fortunes or, I mean, on and on you go. And it doesn't seem to me the job of the National Trust, whose, whose task is to be the steward of its properties, to denigrate them. It should not conceal important facts about them, but it should not, as it were, taint them. Um, and its primary duty is to look after those properties, and it can't look after them if it despises them. So I don't see its um, uh, uh, list as a useful contribution to scholarship. And by the way, it's very, very inaccurate in many points. Um, uh, so there's no scholarship there. I mean, it's mostly Wikipedia, as far as I can see. Um, uh, I see it as a sort of hit list and a charge sheet um, that's been drawn up by this trust that's supposed to look after these properties against these properties. And you can see that very particularly in the entry now removed, I'm glad to say, about Lord Curzon at Kettleston, where it kept attacking him because he'd been Viceroy of India and so forth. Very partial, um, uh, very inaccurate, um, uh, very unfair, um, and also extraordinary because Lord Curzon was one of the greatest benefactors of the National Trust uh, that there's ever been, um, and also was, as Vice Viceroy of India, the most important person in preserving Indian architectural heritage. So um, it just seems to me utterly perverse. Uh, in short, my view is that it is biased. There's nothing wrong with the, with the National Trust um, bringing to light the, the connections between their properties and slavery. I don't wrong with that. Um, but I would also like them, if, if there's a genuinely, as it were, academic rather than politically motivated project, let's also hear about the connection between their properties and um, anti-slavery or um, other humanitarian endeavour. So it, it's the political bias of the project that I object to. At the height of the statue defacing frenzy, one museum curator told her followers how to use household goods to cause irreversible damage to racist statues. Museum curators seem to be stuck in an echo chamber, lecturing to all of us why we should feel bad about our history. The British Museum removed the bust of one of its founding collectors, philanthropist Sir Hans Sloane, who donated 71,000 artefacts. The words of the British Museum's director were perhaps more upfront than he intended. When his bust was removed, he said, We have pushed him off his pedestal. We must not hide anything. Healing is knowledge and that dedication to truthfulness when it comes to history is absolutely crucial, with the aim to rewrite our shared, complicated and at times very painful history. You move forward to the 19th century and you've got what, what one scholar has called um, the creation of an anti-slavery state. The idea of anti-slavery so gripped Britain that for the 19th century, it was one of the dominant features 
of British foreign policy. We stationed um, a fleet off West Africa to stop the trade towards the end of the 19th century when the excesses of that imperial power were undeniable, don't deny them, we get to the end of the, the, 18th, the 19th century and we had a fleet off Zanzibar because the only way the Zanzibar slave trade could be extinguished was by British gunboats. That's a slightly different picture. Imperialism is very, very complex. And when we're talking about uh, decolonizing statues, when we're talking about going through the British Museum and taking Hans Sloane statues down, Hans Sloane saw slavery. Hans Sloane wrote in bitter condemnation of slavery. He happened to be married to somebody who was connected with a plantation. I can't remember whether she was an inheritor or a daughter or whatever, but, but his personal heart towards slavery was one of absolute horror. Well, in the, in, in, in the case of both Roads Must Fall, in the case of um, Black Lives Matter, um, well, in both those cases, note um, the origins were, were not in Britain. One was South Africa, one was America. So, so part of what's wrong with is importing um, um, protest movements from other countries and assuming that what, what applies in South Africa or America applies here. Um, it does seem in America that there is a bit of a problem with the number of uh, black people who are shot by police. The number of black people shot by police in this country is minuscule. Um, that's not to say we don't have problems with racism, but this is a different country with a different tradition and a different set of problems. So part of the, part of the problem with history is, is, is combining um, um, histories from different countries and assuming that they, they apply elsewhere. Um, but the, but the, the other um, mistake is that um, what's assumed about uh, the British colonial past, um, and, and you'll notice that the, the, the phrase colonialism and slavery is used a lot, um, as if colonialism was nothing but slavery. Um, well, that just isn't true. I mean, it, it, it was pretty true from about 1650 to 1807 in the case of British colonialism, but from 1807 till the end of the empire in the 1960s, the British empire was consistently committed to abolishing the slave trade and slavery, Latin America, Atlantic Ocean, Africa, Indian Ocean, Asia. So British colonialism was as much about anti-slavery and more recently than it was about slavery. Here at the Natural History Museum, they planned to review collections after an audit concluded that Charles Darwin's exhibitions could be offensive. Specimens collected on his famous Galapagos voyage were scrutinised, labelled as the ill-gotten gains of a colonialist scientific expedition. Even the museum's ceiling was problematic because it depicts cotton, tea and tobacco, plants that fuelled the British Empire's economy. One of the museum's curators said that science, racism and colonial power were inherently entwined and that museums were put in place to legitimise racist ideology. Covert racism, he said, exists in the gaps between the displays. I think the, the, the decolonising uh, fad that seems to have overtaken a lot of our museums, uh, it, it, it's based on a misreading of history. Um, and uh, I don't like any institution, therefore, that, that incarnates uh, this false narrative about Britain's colonial past. Um, uh, as I say, I'm, 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 I'm all in favour of telling the whole story about the past, the bad bits, certainly, but the good bits too. Right now, uh, the decolonizing narrative, uh, which has been adopted by so many institutions, uh, is obsessed with the the evil bits, and that, that seems to me not only to be impoverishing, but distorting and, frankly, demoralising. The British Library wanted to replace Eurocentric maps, which they said were tools of power, to review collections of classical music and the busts of composers like Mendelssohn and Beethoven, because they're protagonists of Western civilizational supremacy. Even the building itself was under fire, because it was designed to resemble a battleship, a symbol of British imperialism. 
The library's decolonizing working group said that colour blindness was covert white supremacy, and its chief librarian said that racism is a creation of white people. Empire's been around forever. It's been universal. The Chinese did it. The Arabs did it. The Chinese still do it. <laughs> uh, the Aztecs did it. The Comanche did it. The Zulu did it. The Ashanti did it. Right? So, so um, long before the Europeans started in the 1500, late 1500s, um, non-Europeans were doing empire all over the world. And as for racism, um, uh, in the medieval period, uh, Arabs, I, I think particularly of, a, of an Arab philosopher, um, who tried to explain why it was that uh, Arab Muslims were, were so much more advanced than, uh, than uh, Western Europeans or black Africans. Uh, and he attributed it to the climate that uh, the Western Europeans are too cold and the Africans are too hot, uh, right? So, um, but that, that actually, the, the, ex the explanation of racial difference in terms of climate uh, was quite popular during the early Enlightenment as well in Europe. But we weren't the first to think in those, in those racialized terms. And of course, the Chinese famously, when, when Westerners came to kowtow to the emperor in the 19th century, the, the Chinese famously regarded Westerners as, bar as barbarians. So we, didn't, we in the West didn't invent racism either. The Church of England is arguably one of the most important institutions in the country. It's the caretaker of countless priceless pieces of our history. But these monuments, buildings and artefacts are now under threat. These are at risk because the Archbishop of Canterbury has asked his cathedrals and parishes to review the buildings and monuments in their care, scouring them for links to colonialism or slavery. And this could see those monuments altered, relocated or removed. But it's a, it's a bad tendency and it's actually a sort of self-hating tendency. Um, if you wander around a Christian graveyard, it seems to be wrong to start sort of trying to Google each person on the tomb and see whether they behave badly or not. They are dead and they are commemorated and it's right that they should be commemorated. And there's an overwhelming onus um, on a charitable body and a Christian body to show why that should not be so if they wish to change it. Well, it depends, it depends which statues we're talking about, but uh, my view of statues on Church of England property is the same as my view of statues elsewhere. Unless we're celebrating something uh, as morally unambiguous as uh, Stalin, Hitler or Pol Pot, uh, I would let the statues or the plaques remain um, uh, because they're, they're part of our ambiguous past. If you want to erect uh, other statues and plaques that are uh, politically countervailing, then go ahead, but leave the statues and the plaques where they are. A leaked draft report from the Church of England's anti-racism task force even expressed the desire to decolonize theology. According to the report, systemic racism has its roots in theology, in Eurocentrism, Christendom and white normativity, and the church perpetuates racism through what they called predominantly white male theological perspectives and forms of knowledge. A copy of the draft report was leaked and the draft report contained some really extraordinary clauses which when the report was finally released in its final form were removed. In the end we had chapters on what the church should do in terms of its uh, attitude towards theology, slavery and history, key, key parts of the way in which the church will be addressing the future were simply uh, cut down to a few rather anodyne paragraphs. But we had the draft report which came out and uh, since the final reports come out, the response from Lambeth Palace has been that the authors of the report were wise clergy and lay people. Therefore, we can assume that the draft report also comes from the same wise clergy and lay people and it contained uh, a, 
a review of the church's theology and the way it should be radically transformed. All that was Eurocentric, uh, imperialist, uh, white supremacist needed to be examined and removed. In its place, black theology needed to be taught to all ordinands. It looked at history and it said that the church needed to review its history and with its involvement in slavery and its involvement in uh, building churches with money that had been earned from slavery. It produced a number of other recommendations which came through in the final report which were certainly questionable. Uh, the proposal was that um, all church employees should undergo anti-racism training and unconscious bias training every two years compulsorily. The question is who's going to write the anti-racism training? Most probably the anti-racism training will be written by the very same people that have been appointed or their colleagues have been appointed to these particular honours and positions within the Church of England. Black theology has, uh, has a very, very close connection really with what we have been hearing since the summer, critical race theory. So many of the words are all the same, the buzzwords, the phrases, the central concepts that uh, we live in a society which is disturbingly heteronormative, that needs to be overturned, it should not be patriarchal any longer. Each generation has a duty to those who came before us, as well as those who will come after us, to protect our irreplaceable inheritance. The movement to decolonize is driven by a minority of very convinced people, um, supported passively but by a majority of people who are either indifferent or ignorant or intimidated. If that's the case, then um, if some people uh, stand up and tell the whole truth, uh, so uh, tell the whole truth about the British Empire, the good bits as well as the bad, uh, following the uh, recent Sewell report on race, point out that not all racial disparities are caused by racism. Um, and if others will give those people platforms, and if more people do it, the um, ignorant, indifferent, um, perhaps intimidated majority will begin to pay attention. And the power of the noisy convinced, illiberal minority will begin to dissipate. First of all, I think it's important to try to learn things, to know things. Um, and people actually don't do that much. So, um, and of course, unfortunately, they're not taught about it either. So um, it's difficult to start, but, and, but it, we can be a bit blind um, to the history, which actually in a country like Britain, we're lucky enough to have all around us in visual terms. Um, you know, you can, I mean, here we take a coin um, it's got these little bits on it that people don't read, but if you do, you will see, you know, why does it say um, Elizabeth II DG um, uh, and DG Reg, and uh, I think it says FD, it, it certainly does on some coins, which means Fide Defense or Defender of the Faith. Why is she called Defender of the Faith? It's a very funny story why she's called Defender of the Faith because it was a title given to Henry VIII shortly before he threw over Catholicism um, uh, because he'd written a, um, a particular work which pleased the Pope. Very odd story, tells you quite a lot about what happened then, how this goes on to the modern era um, and the more you think about that and you you think about you know what is all this made composed of, I don't mean scientifically made of, but what's going on here? Why do we have this, this particular image? Why is this family there? Why is that the sovereign? Why do we believe that it has a value, etc., etc.? There's a history lesson everywhere, all around us, um, and, and we're not encouraged to look at it. In fact, we're encouraged not to look at it because we don't really, um, because it's bad, is what's being said. And the only way, the only right way to look at it is to um, attack it. I'm not saying 
I don't wish to sentimentalise about it. I'm not saying this is all good, uh, but I think the first thing you have to do is understand it. Um, and if you spend your life just a, your, if you spend your life just attacking um, people who did things in the past, um, that is it's a sort of cheap shot. And the same thing will happen to you, and you will in, have engaged in a great collective act of forgetting and of misrepresentation. And on the whole, if you study the past properly, you will become wiser and more tolerant. If only it were all so simple, the most famous Soviet dissident wrote. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. He also made a prescription, live not by lies. The core of this is an assault on reality, on our ability to face things truthfully, whether it's our history or ourselves. This should worry us because we have such a lot to lose. It's a fight for a return to a worldview based on forgiveness, honesty, humility and fairness. And to remember, as St Paul said, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yeah.